Okay. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can see. If you need me to change the font sizes, I can try, but I think it's past that point once it's in a PDF. So today, um, the objective of the room's talk, you be talking about uh, Bluster file system. Um, as part of that conversation, we'll talk about general storage, landscape, terminology, pros and cons of the different methods of managing storage. Uh, a quick blurb on what Bluster is. Just a high level, quick glossy over of the competitive landscape, like what products would you compare something like GlusterFS to. Um, and then we'll go specifically into what is a Gluster, what are the use cases it's trying to solve, uh, how is it architected, and when it comes down to the demonstrations, as we were kind of talking before the presentation, I don't have a running demo, but I've got a bunch of virtual machines and the, uh, the Red Hat uh, uh, storage um, ISO running on a couple of VMs so we can play with it. Maybe if we read a couple of docs, it should be pretty easy to string together and create a, a volume. So, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, my background is I'm currently seven plus years at Red Hat. I'm a principal solutions architect. Been with the company, uh, like I mentioned, for seven years, but before that, before I joined sales, um, I was a system administrator like a lot of you guys are. Never in development, but always administration. Um, again, 15, 18 years of that stuff from Deck Ultrix is kind of where I cut my teeth with Unix um, to you name it, Sun Solaris, HPUX, AIX. And of course, during that whole time, I was always playing with Linux because I grew up in the university with Unix. Um, Quick disclaimer, I'm not going to read it to you word for word, but basically I do this as a kind of as a hobby to do presentations. I try really hard to make sure the information I present to you guys is accurate. But, you know, do your own background checking and, and double check everything you do before you go to your production box and play with it. Um, other basic things, you'll see that I deliberately don't play with SE Linux and IP tables during any of the demos. My performance talks, I usually leave that out of the equation. Um, anytime we do talk about performance, performance tuning is always kind of an art, so you can't make a machine go faster than what the bare metal machine can do by itself, so there's no magic tunables to make things run faster. Everything, every time you tune a dial one way, you're forfeiting some other type of performance characteristic. So you've got to kind of know what you're doing, you've got to understand your hardware, always got to understand what goals you're trying to meet. and. Again, you know, the question of what are the best practices, it's, it's a difficult question to ask, so a difficult question to answer, so I always recommend you doing your homework. Although, in RHEL 6 and in RHEL 5, there are now tuning daemons that you can run with specific predefined profiles. So if you look at RHEL 6, you'll probably find this in CentOS also, uh, there's a daemon called TuneD. You install the TuneD package, and then there's a utility called TuneD ADM. You can list out a bunch of profiles like low latency networking, enterprise storage, laptop battery saver, desktop performance, da da da. There's about 10 different profiles you pick from, and when you set that with TuneD, it's going to change all the kernel parameters, all the file system parameters, and everything in the network buffers to address that type of workload. So if you want best practice, that's about as close as it gets now. And it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy, it's a good starting point. Krista? Yes. I, I know it's not Blaster, but TuneD. Can I run a RHEL system in my normal production workload? Mm -hmm. Say I'm in testing. And have TuneD look at it and advise me the best way to tune it? Um, so TuneD doesn't work in, in that capacity. It's really more take a predefined set of parameters, which the Red Hat engineers and whoever contributes to TuneD has come up with mm -hmm. um, and applies it to your system. Um, there is another tool that I don't think is shipping with standard RHEL, but it's part of our uh, real-time kernel package, which is uh, Tuna, which is a graphical tuning tool. So that's kind of more what you're looking for. I think you can find that in the, uh, the Fedora tool chain. Tuna? Tuna, like, oh, tuna. like a tuna fish. Mm -hmm. So look at, look at Tuna, and that's a graphical tool. It gives you more real time. It allows you to take processes and pin them to CPUs, uh, evacuate CPUs to isolate certain brands and stuff. It gives you a lot more capability. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, virtualization and performance is always a big topic, especially when we're talking about something like uh, ClusterFS. Um, so obviously modern systems are always better than older systems. Um, there's a lot of virtualization built into hardware these days. So when we look at Linux and KVM, it's leveraging all these capabilities that Intel and AMD are putting in the hardware. Um, that benefits us in performance, it benefits us in that the, the code simplicity is better, uh, the maintenance and the further development, the rapid feature adoption of new technologies is a lot faster. So you need to understand what your hardware is doing again. Um, however, more sockets and more memory traditionally also leads to more complicated systems tuning. Now you're talking about NUMA. So you, know, you need to understand your NUMA topology in the system and how your memory is architected so that your processes and your memory is all kind of bound in ways that you not, you know, it's not hurting your performance. So enough of that. If you need to, um, I'm going to post, post all these slides up on the blue web page soon, so, but here's some guidelines of where you find different, uh, good docs. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't do is they don't install the, uh, the kernel doc package. Um, that's basically where you're going to find the one text document that gives you all the kernel tunables. So if you're always wondering, like, hey, where's that tunable for the kernel and the grub parameter that does X, Y, Z, it's documented in that, in that package. Um, and if you are a Red Hat customer and you have access to the Red Hat customer portal, there's a giant wealth of uh, white papers and all kinds of uh, knowledge-based documents in there. A lot of it is public. Some of it is basically requires you to have a login. Having a login doesn't mean you have to be a paying customer. It just means you have to register for an account. Um, other basic things, if you are trying to do performance tuning, good places to go to for you know references because every one of these organizations publishes all their benchmarks all the publications include all the tuning so if you're looking to tune a low latency workload go to stack look at their tuning guidelines and you'll see it a whole you know pages worth of things that they do to squeeze every ounce of performance and a lot of that it's like 50 percent of it you're going to throw right out because it's not real real world type of workload you know if they're tuning on turning off all the file system benefits to basically squeeze a little bit of I.O. to benefit a, a network workload. You know, always take everything and evaluate it carefully. Okay. On with cluster. Okay, so basic storage terminology. Um, I'm hoping everybody's familiar with direct attached storage, right? So my laptop has a hard drive, that's direct attached storage. Uh, there's a couple of SATA drives in here, that's direct attached. This is my data center, and I have an HBA adapter, and it connects to my SAN to my uh, EMC DMX. That's direct attached. It's basically block I/O attached to the system. You're busy with uh, managing file systems, creating volumes. You're doing things like setting up uh, fabrics of storage networks and switches and zoning and LUN masking. I mean, it's a whole art into itself to manage direct attached storage that's centralized. You're including uh, HBA. I just throw the term in there as an HBA because you typically know. Direct don't. attach? An HBA adapter? Yeah. Okay. No? The adapter is what the. Yeah. Okay. For, for purposes, go. You think that uh, like an iSCSI adapter still falls under the HBA category and shouldn't be there? Well, dude. It depends on the distinction you want to make. When, when the disks are off in another room still connected over a, a shared bus and a switch, it, it's, it may still be a block device, but yeah. yeah I'm, I included it only in the sense that you've got another piece of hardware in your stack that you need to manage, whether it's device drivers, specialized cables, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to throw everything yeah. into a basket that says this is how complicated direct attached can be. Right. When it comes to network attached storage, all that gets hidden behind an appliance that's basically serving up network attached storage. So there's no file <coughs> system, there's no individual disk management from the client end. You're simply attaching to a file system and you get busy with sharing your files. Um, downsides to that is typically you have issues with uh, locking. <laughs> so if two systems want to share the same file, how do they arbitrate who gets access or 
who gets access to what parts of the file, how do you avoid corruption, etc. Um, network attached storage is typically not as fast or as um, flexible as, as direct attached storage. So each has its pros and cons. Um, other basic concepts you get into anytime you're trying to you know, make speed faster, or something more redundant or more efficient. Um, caching. Your direct attached storage will typically have giant cache front ends which cost a lot of money. Network attached storage will do the same thing. You'll throw a big cache on there and all of a sudden the number of disks or the, the number of spindles, the size of the disk becomes less important because you've got this massive cache on the front. But cache isn't battery backed, you've introduced yourself to a lot of risk. Yep. So like a lot of these basic drives that you buy for your desktops have built-in 16 meg caches. It's not battery backed cache, it doesn't really protect you from any kind of power loss. So it can come back and bite you if you're not, you, know, you don't protect yourself from that. Um, other basic topics, uh, RAID, which you know is there to introduce some um, data redundancy in, in your uh, storage. Uh, JBOD, just a bunch of disks. Other pieces of this conversation, you want to replicate your data. So if I write it once, I want to show up in two different places. Um, of course, once you write it in two different places, now you want to deal with deduplication so you don't have as much storage consumed with the same amount of data. So you look for ways to consolidate that. Um, as you build up more storage pools, your systems are you know, they sit all over the data center or different regions and I have to deal with data locality. So if I'm replicating my data to different facilities and my node over there needs to access a file that's over here, if there's a copy there, how does it know where, where to go to kind of thing? This is the concept of data locality. You need your node as close to data as possible so you have better performance. Um, concepts of structured versus unstructured data. So structured data, database, object data, um, unstructured data, files, you know, your spreadsheets, your text files, this is all stuff that doesn't have any structure, it's just random data that sits in a file system. Um, concept of uh, global namespace. The more data silos you have, the more mount points you have to deal with. If you have one global namespace that has one mount point and you can basically cleanly architect your file system or your volume into that one namespace, you, you stop siloing everything and it basically everything becomes organized. But now the underlying volume has to deal with the replication, the deduplication. So that's that's where Gluster is kind of starting to fit in now, is where you've got all this distribution of redundancy in your data, but you're trying to pull it all together and leave it under a single global namespace. And then of course security is always important. So the basic list of challenges that I came up with when you're dealing with storage. Speed is obviously the first one. Capacity, you know, how reliably can you write the data to the disk? Uh, how available is it? You know, can it deal with interruptions, uh, serviceability, if something goes wrong? Can you hot fix a component without having to take the entire thing offline? Um, manageability is always a big one. Um, and that's both from the storage configuration to the client configuration and also how the data is configured. You know, where is the data going to sit in, in the uh, organization? And then ultimately, all those come down to cost. You know, what are you willing to pay? You know, because if you want the fastest system that provides all this stuff, you're paying top dollar for your storage system. If you can get away with two of those, then your, your cost will drop. So always understand what you're trying to do, and you're going to get your best cost effectiveness. Okay, so everywhere you see what is Red Hat storage, you can say, what is Gluster? Gluster was acquired by Red Hat. Uh, about a year and a half ago, and in that year and a half, we've essentially, I say we, I, I do work for Red Hat, but I don't work for that organization. So Red Hat has essentially taken what was ClusterFS that was based on CentOS and rebuilt it on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and in doing so, also replaced the, the default file system that it uses, which is ext4 with XFS, which is the former general file system that came from Silicon Graphics. Um, they did this for performance reasons and also for scalability reasons. Um, I don't know, but four or five years ago, I think Red Hat acquired a lot of the, uh, uh, the developers that used to work on XFS and are sitting on Red Hat these days. Hmm. Which is why we support XFS as part of our, our building. 
Um, okay, so here's your marketing bingo scorecard. Red Hat Storage, or Gluster, is an open, unified, extensible, scale-out, network-attached storage. That's the first real meaningful thing. Network-attached storage, this is where it fits in. Uh, object storage software solution for on-premise, virtualized, or cloud environments. So, what does that mean? If you take your commodity machine, my, my box here, and let's say it has 10 disks inside, mine's only got three, but let's say you have 10 disks inside there. You use two disks for the operating system. I've got nine disks left over. I load the cluster software and I essentially turn this into a cluster node that has available storage capacity. So I have this box, let me stand up another box next to it, or 10 machines next to it. All of these machines can basically bind themselves together into a cluster volume, which is why we call it a scale out storage solution. I can do this with commodity boxes, with commodity storage, and just continue to scale out the volume uh, way past what your traditional direct attached storage can get to. Because the whole idea is we want to be able to scale the volume dynamically without having to impact delivery of your data. So, basically, that's what the picture shows here, right? I've got Commodity new machine with a bunch of disks. Um, the disks do get formatted into something we call a brick. So a, a single host will have any number of bricks of storage, and a brick is basically the smallest unit of storage that belongs to a cluster volume. So if I've got 10 bricks of cluster available in this one, my next node might have 20, depending on what type of disk. All the systems don't have to be the same. That's the other part of this equation. Um, and so basically, you string all these machines together, and then Gluster, in its infinite wisdom of how to build these volumes, provides all these other features like global namespace. Um, let's see, uh, actually it's on the next slide. But you know, the, the replication, the, uh, what am I trying to get to? So the, the replication of data, the ability to string it all out and, and push uh, large volumes of, of storage. Okay. So, Actually, the previous slide also depicts one thing. So this is the on-premise model. So the way we sh ship the, uh, the storage appliance today is as an ISO. So it's, not, it's still built on traditional RHEL, but the idea is you take the Red Hat storage ISO, you load it on the system, you play the 10 questions, and then it's basically ready for action. Um, it's, n it's not designed for general workload, like you're going to run Oracle on top of it and still use Gluster on the side. It's meant to be a storage appliance. Um, although that's starting to change now because we're also doing things with like Hadoop. Um, and so in that model where you've got MapReduce or other you know, um, processes going on, the, the cluster components becomes a part of that whole stack, but I can talk to that in a minute. Yeah? Um, I don't know what the difference is between DAS and JPOD. Do they mean the same thing or, or is there a slight difference? Uh, da, da, da. So deploys of Red Hat servers, underlying storage, direct attached, or JBOD. So that's basically the, the concept is that JBOD, right, just, just a bunch of disks, direct attach, uh, could also resemble some type of um, HPA type. Uh, I don't think we support SAN attached storage <coughs> just yet, um, but that's probably in, in the roadmap. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and I know also that like if you're looking like a, a you know a commodity machine is one thing, but we do strongly encourage having a, a RAID controller or battery back cache so that you can deal with individual disk failures. But that's a, a relatively cheap investment to avoid you know entire system outage because you're losing disk. So mm -hmm. a little bit of RAID, and that's probably where that terminology gets inserted there. So this is the on-premise concept. Because it's an ISO, you can also load this ISO into a virtual machine. So if you have, you know, doing it on VMware in your data center is probably not the most obvious choice. But if you had, let's say, Amazon EC2 and you loaded the Red Hat storage ISO into an Amazon you know, image, and then you've got their storage backend, there's not a whole lot you can do with their storage on the backend except work within the Amazon world. But once you tie in the, the Red Hat storage appliance, now it basically becomes cheap replication for you, know, you might have local here. And this is why part of the, the, the Gluster story is both on-premise and cloud, and then there's a way to kind of bring those two together. Yeah, I mean, it even has it here, the Amazon images up here. 
Basic concept again, you've got multiple machines that tie together into a cluster volume. Each machine will, you know, you'll define what your smallest brick size is, and then you format and build the bricks in the unit, and then you bind those into your cluster FS volume, and then you have your individual cluster nodes. Now, this is the actual stack of what everything includes. So, in this case, you intend to brick it. What's that? So, in this case, you intend to brick it. <laughs> you know, Steve I don't follow. He's cheap. He does good bricks. See, it's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke, son. I know. <clears throat> okay. So again, at the foundation, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. All of the hardware enablement, compatibility, certifications that we do, that's the benefit of Red Hat Enterprise Linux here. Um, all the network devices, the block devices, all the hardware enablement, uh, the network stack, the logical volume manager, these are all components of, of what we're uh, utilizing to deliver the cluster file system to the, uh, to the user experience at the top. Um, you'll see here the local file system is, is XFS and then other. Um, it depends on the translators. Uh, this is where it gets kind of good for me because this is uh, kind of in the weeds. But essentially, the cluster framework operates on a set of translators, and these translators, as it explained to me, are basically the, the modules. So as, for example, you want to uh, import and export data out of your cluster file system um, through <coughs> NFS, there's an NFS translator. Through SIFS, there's a SIFS translator. Through, uh, um, what do you, if you're going to do uh, the replication, that's a translator. So all these modules are there, and this is what makes ClusterFS also very extensible so that, you know, if what we're delivering in the, the cluster uh, appliance, there's an opportunity for any customer to extend that to basically build new use cases with the product. Um, Swift is a, an interface that's being used by OpenStack, so Red Hat's also in the process of trying to deliver an OpenStack implementation. Um, Fuse is the file systems and user space, so if you happen to use the native cluster file system, it attaches to the kernel Fuse module. Um, talk about why you might want to use the, cluster, the native cluster FS as opposed to um, an NFS or a SIFS type binding from the client in just a second. Um, and then up on top also is the, uh, the NFS implementation. So one thing I will point out is if you're familiar with Linux, the NFS implementation was rewritten as a part of ClusterFS. It's not the same NFS that you get with the Linux kernel. Um, I don't know what the, what the reasons for that is, so but if you're used to a lot of flags and bells and whistles and you set up your NCI exports for Linux, it's not the same. I think they're working towards some level of parity, but not quite there yet. Um, other basic concepts on the right-hand side here, so the replication, the multi-site DR, um, quality of service C groups. So that's an important thing I will bring up now. You guys, I did a presentation here last year, uh, I think it was April, on C groups. Um, anybody know what C groups is or doesn't know what C groups are? Okay. That would be everyone. Is that okay? Bad, bad question. Who knows what C groups is? All right, handful. Um, so I'll keep it short. For those who don't, it's a it's an instrumentation of the kernel that allows you to do resource management. Um, in a nutshell, I've got a process, ten threads, and I want to limit how much CPU, how much disk I/O, and how much network I/O those processes take up, so that it doesn't consume the entire machine. For example, I want to put Oracle on the box have multiple Oracle databases running. I want one to have priority over all the others. C groups is the tool set that we use to get that done. Uh, that's part of RHEL 6, uh, not in RHEL 5. So, but that's what we're leveraging here in the ClusterFS space, is we're running uh, ClusterFS on top of RHEL 6, and we then leverage C groups to basically guarantee that the cluster components have the performance they need to deliver the SLAs and then you leave the rest of the workload to other things on the box. So, 
basic design goals. It's all about scaling out. Um, ClusterFS implements something called the Elastic Hashing Algorithm. So if you look at some of the competitive products like, uh, like an Isilon or I think even the, the Hadoop HFS also falls into this space, but they all have like a, like a compute node or a metadata node so that when a client connects to the volume and it's trying to figure out where the data is, it has to go back to a central database, if you want to call it that, that basically figures out, you're looking for this file that's on that host. So you, this metadata becomes a bottleneck. Uh, because of the way GlosserFS runs, that's all done in a formula called this elastic caching algorithm. And so now, um, a client that connects via NFS obviously has to go to that first node, the NFS server, and then it'll figure out where the data is uh, by itself without having to go to a metadata server. If you're running the native cluster FS um, uh, inter interconnect on the uh, on the host itself, so using the native cluster file system locally on the client, then the client has access to that algorithm and it'll figure out where the data is by itself. So that way you can bypass, you can just go direct and go get your data. So that's the advantage of using the the local cluster FS. Um, but again, that's you know, if you're using Windows or other non-Linux platforms, it's a little bit more challenging. So that's why we have an FSN6. Yeah? Is that the same as Diffuse uh, interface you were talking about? Yes. Okay. So the, the Fuse interface basically allows for modules to attach to the kernel from user space. It's basically file systems in user space. That's what Fuse stands for. Um, and then the Gluster FS is just a module that snaps on top of that. So there's. I've seen some talk that you know eventually that might turn into a kernel driver because of performance reasons, but uh, you know, at this point the flexibility that Fuse offers makes that quick and easy, and it still provides some advantages over uh, native NFS or uh, Zips. Um, so linear scalability, because you don't have metadata storage, I continue to add more machines. The more CPUs, the more memory, everything else just keep aggregating, you should get linear scale. There won't be any drop-offs because you hit some, you know, my metadata server needs to be upgraded kind of a thing. So it should all be linear. Um, flexibility to adapt and grow and reduce the data at, at will. Um, add, remove, add and remove resources. Deployment agnostic, meaning again, either on-premise, public cloud, or hybrid, like connect the two together. Um, and then the whole concept of, you know, it's got to run on commodity software, the hardware. We don't want to get into the specialized hardware game. So, you know, the whole benefit of having the storage server in software is that it does provide you all that flexibility. So, just the overall value proposition, you know, it's going to be highly scalable. We're trying to be cost effective. Uh, it's all about flexibility. Um, one good use case, you know, if you think of a, a service like Pandora um, or Netflix, you know, they just store massive amounts of data. If you have to constantly rearrange your data because you've exceeded the capacity of a, you know, an EMC DMX or a NetApp filer, and now you're standing up another one, now you got to, you know, divide your movies that start with the letter A into A. AA through AN or something like that. And you, you get into weird scenarios of how you're, are you hashing out your data. So if you can keep it all in one global namespace and just keep scaling it out, that's where the value proposition here really plays itself out. Um, and I didn't call it out yet, but I'll mention it now. Um, there's an object-based store coming uh, as part of our Hadoop integration. So the whole concept here is that instead of using HFS, which has some potential um, performance bottlenecks because of what I've mentioned already, uh, you substitute and use cluster FS in, in that mix instead. So, um, so basic landscape, right? Direct attach, EMC, prepar, IBM, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, even when you get down to HPA adapters, you know, you're always looking at specialized cards from LSI, HP, OK, NULX, what have you. Um, once you get into network attached storage, you're using fairly commodity you know, network adapters, whether it's 10 gig, single gig. Um, but the, name, you know, the, the, the names you hear most when we go in and talk to you know, where we're trying to display something, 
Um, even then, I was really still kind of on a, an island. It's, that's not really a, a play for um, for Gloucester yet. Uh, but Isilon seems to be one that, that uh, is a good good fit because it's very expensive and costly. And basically, provides a hardware-based solution as opposed to a software-based solution. Um, and I threw in the HP Store Easy slash Left Hand, even though I've never played with it. I think it's kind of a sim similar concept, software-based solution that HP provides to basically have an ESX host provide storage with something that's local. So I don't know a terrible amount about it, but have heard it a couple times. Um, and then other software-based solutions. I threw in FreeNAS because it's everybody's familiar with it. Um, I don't do too much in this space, so if you guys have any recommendations, you want me to add some more to it, I'm happy to. But anybody else playing with the software-based storage? How about like Seth or uh What's this? Ceph. C E P H. Yeah. It's in the Linux kernel. Um, it's another just, you know network enabled distributed file system. And there's Prello NFS also. NFS. So I think PNFS is in the roadmaps for RHEL. That's not quite there yet. Yeah. Right. A lot of work going on. Use the green ass and I can say it's uh, performing a lot better than it is uh, commercial. Uh, uh, network it has this uh, <coughs> like Western Digital or whatever. Yep. You you're using FreeNAS? Yeah. How big your software? It's one of those HP little cubes, the old smartest. Mm -hmm. And runs the old software <coughs> flash drive. That's pretty digs into the things I could run the CFS part with. And it's four great. Oh that's right, it uses CFS, right? Mm -hmm. I guess the thing is that this slide is written from sort of the uh, Red Hat sales guide point of view. Because me? No, I, I threw this in there just so. Okay. So because reading um, reading the things that you put up there, those are like other people's products in the Red Hat storage server space. Whereas no, this is this is the itself no. is just a network file system. I mean, a distributed you know network file system. Right? So these slides are things I put together to help create conversation. I never know what the exp expertise level, the experience level is here. So sometimes if somebody doesn't understand something, if I say an isolon or something along those lines, then, then you can make some, some relative judgment and begin to, to level the, uh, the discussion. So, you know, I, I, I use this as kind of a, a guide to, again, just create conversation. Okay. So currently... But yeah, I'm a sales guy and I did put them together. Currently, um, where... Red Hat positions cluster, you will see SUS and Canonical position set. But they're not the same thing. So you'll have to make your own comparison. Yeah. It means uh, oh, Mike, you want to go without the network? On that it's so good should be yep. open file. Okay. Do you have personal experience with open file? Yeah, a little bit. I found the thing. So there's a dizzying number of file systems coming out these days. This, this, this um, big data group over at CSIP, they want to use something called SciDB, mm -hmm. which has a file system that has error bars. And, I mean, there's, there's so much experimentation with file systems going on right now. Now, the cluster FS, maybe get underneath and change some of these traditional, uh, I, I mean, can you use cluster FS if you've got some oddball, low-level format? That's a general question. I guess it's a, it's a subjective answer. But, uh, what was it? You mentioned something called SciFS? SciDB. So SciDB is the, one of the PIs of the, of the MIT Big Data Initiative is Michael Stonebreaker. Okay. So he comes out with a file system every three weeks as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it's SI or PSI? Uh, <laughs> SCI, capital D, capital B, all one word. And there's a... That's all. So, so you can get a licensed version of SciDB and, and format your drives with that, or you can get the, uh, the academic version. Okay. And, uh, so there's a lot of people trying to figure out how this is going to either expedite certain academic kind of pursuits uh, that make storing your, your data easier, um, but, but I don't know if packages like this will, will sit on top of it. So, um, not knowing exactly how that fits in, um, I mean, if you look at how this works, you can 
kind of start to understand the, the fundamental concept. The, the, the brick of storage is an XFS formatted file system. It's a POSIX file system. Okay. So when you write your data to the cluster of file systems, it shows up eventually in a normal file system. And then the hashing algorithm is what basically connects the client to the data when it's requesting that data. Now, it's these other translators that basically provide the interfaces to how you get to that data. So like the, the Hadoop interconnect that I was talking about, um, the, these components that do replication and all these other features, that's where all these modules come into play. So not knowing what that is, but if there's a weakness somewhere in that side EB system and then there's an opportunity that you just need a file system that scales out and provides all these other features, then yeah, maybe it could fit in something like that. But, yeah. but is SideDB exposed as a file system? I thought it was a, more of a database. I, th I think there's components to it, and I think SciFS is one of them, but I, I, um. I, might, I might have my, um, this may have been one of the other initiatives. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I talked to a guy that runs PHPBB, and he said they're looking at, at doing a, a specialized file system for that kind of traffic, too. Hmm. Lots of small chunks rather than large writes, and, and take advantage of the I.O. that you get with, uh, you know, with busy small websites. Riser FS is going to have its day, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Somebody's going to fix it. <laughs> okay, um, so with that, let's see if we can't get some kind of demo going just to show you how this works. Um, I'll show you what it looks like to install the, um, the Red Hat storage appliance. It's actually pretty simple. We're going to use the verb manager for that. Anybody using virtualization in CentOS or RHEL? Yeah. Everybody familiar with the Vert Manager? Okay. This is just a, the basic GUI to do single node virtualization. It's not really your data center management tool. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. Click new, give it a name, right at storage, maybe this one 12. I'm going to use a local ISO. And my ISO. Um, just so you know, when you when you change your OS type in the version, it basically just sets some default uh, I/O interfaces so that when the operating system comes up, it's using optimized stuff like Vert I/O. If you make everything generic, it's going to come up with like a you know a SCSI interface and some uh, generic uh, network interface, which has to go through emulation, which is a lot slower. So if you can optimize here, it's always better. Okay, any, any questions on that? I'm just basically setting up a virtual machine. And uh, this looks just like a Red Hat install. You just hit enter. If you hit tab, it's, it would have said install, so there's not really a whole lot to do. Again, this is meant to be a, an appliance, so it's an ISO default install. There's not really much to play with. It'll ask you for a root password. This guy's off to the races, he'll just start doing his package installs. So, in the meantime, um, I will point you to, where is my file here? Um, if you're interested, 
obviously all of our documentation is publicly available. So you go to the redhat.com slash docs page and you'll find the storage subsection. Um, there's an installation guide, which is you know a pretty short, realistically about 10 pages worth of installation, which I've just done in the last two minutes, right? You run the install. Um, this guide does not go through configuration. For that, you go to the administration guide, which is this guy. Uh, it's a little bit lengthier, and it does tend to jump around. I've done my best to kind of look through exactly, you know, what are the steps you take, you know, one, two, three, in setting up a cluster volume. And it seems like the uh, the first thing you'd have to do is build your trusted storage pools, um, and you do that by basically adding peers to the cluster volume. Um, you don't do it with node one. It's always, each new system is always a peer of itself. Um, so then you basically start adding the other peers. Uh, the key thing here is that every system has to be in DNS, so you kind of have to have a fairly well configured network and system infrastructure where things make sense. Lab, in the lab, it's going to be difficult if you don't have controlled DNS. Um, so we can try this. I've got two nodes in here. I think I've got my name service right, so if I do a host on HS11, an IP. So I should, in principle, be able to do, and this is the first time I'm doing this, so if it goes wrong. Is there any reason the DNS needs to be globally available for the whole world? No. So a lot of you can just start Yeah, a little DNS, DNS mask or something. I mean, I'm just doing virtual networking in the same machine, so I've got, I'm going to have three storage nodes. Um, are disconnected here. Nothing public. And I would assume you could even get away if you had everything in your Etsy host file with no DNS. It would still be sufficient as long as as long as the uh, the get end works for host, then it should be okay. Uh, let's see. Sorry, right? Just. The other thing is you have to have, a, there's a cluster daemon that has to be running. I checked it earlier and it was, let me go see what's going on. It's there. Uh, if you want to do it officially, you say service. Uh, 12 is still loading. Oh. With this guy. So I'm going to have to fix his network. That's cool to do for uh, averages 11. So. so I went from 10 to 11. Is it unusual for it to take this long? I don't know. I've never done it before. Oh, okay. oh there you go. It's probably successful. All right. Go ahead and finish off this other guy. Get him configured. Alright. Um, so once you get that done, then you have to build your um, storage volumes. <coughs> you do that first by going to where is it? I need to add more storage to these guys first. Let's do this. <coughs> okay. Everybody familiar with logical volume commands? Creating a 10 gig volume in my logical volumes for uh, for these virtual machines.
this. Go to info. Add hardware. Storage. So what did spring the ground? Browse local. The second disc has already shown up there. It's a BDB, so it uh, showed up hot. Um, I think that was something that was added in the 6.3 release that we could do a hot storage at. Maybe even earlier. Um, okay, so that's that guy. It's a new, uh, a new DOS partition table on it. I hope. Yes. <laughs> Been doing it for so long, I may have picked up the wrong reason. But it just wipes out whatever's there, gives you a clean DOS partition table. Right. So then you quit, and now you do a make FS uh, dash FS dash XFS. And XFS is included in the Red Hat storage appliance. Uh, if you're doing this with RHEL, XFS is an add-on. I don't know how CentOS distributes XOS, uh, XFS. Same way. As an app, I mean, is it just a package? Because yeah, yeah. with Red Hat, it's actually an extra entitlement that shows up in a different software channel. Huh. Is that like a it's an add-on. Uh, module, or is it built in with a kernel? Uh, so the, the, the kernel module's there, just all the utilities are not. So we, it's basically an add-on. Um, if you look at any of the uh, Red Hat sheets on specifications for file system sizes, uh, I think we top out at 16 terabytes for ext4 and 3, um, and we want to uh, encourage customers to do XFS for larger file systems. Um, due to <coughs> that's what's been tested and is out there, and XFS has been around for a long time. It's uh, it's very well known in its performance characteristics and recovery and all the other stuff. Um, I don't know what the, what the long-term strategy is, whether it's ext4 or ButterFS, um, or if XFS could eventually become the default. You know what the license history on it, XFS is? Uh, History-wise, no. Yeah. <coughs> Silicon, Silicon Graphics open source it before it folded. Oh, is that right? Um, and then Red Hat uh, picked up a couple of developers we're able to maintain it, but it is open source today. I mean, Suze, uh, this Les guys had XFS in there a long time ago. And they also had Riser. Um, okay, and I need to figure out, there is one, I have to specify a block size of 512. I think so. Riser was the standard on SUSE Linux for a long time ago. Until Hans decided to kill his wife. <laughs> I think uh, the Wikipedia matrix as a file system, there's a characteristic for kills your wife. There's a, there's a label. <laughs> 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 Check it out. <laughs> used to. It works the same. I would have worked It works the same. Okay, that's interesting. It looks like it worked. Um, let's do the same for 11. Info. Add hardware. Storage. This. Browse. Browse local. Minus.
Oh, you know what? I had a, uh, a virtual machine that was a, a Windows VM. So, yeah, probably figure out what that used to be. Well. Okay. So it's not that crazy. So, we've added our service to the trusted storage pool. So now I basically just need to do back in, I hope. See so how simple this is. Anybody can do it the first time. You keep yeah. saying calling it a trusted storage pool. Why is it trusted? <coughs> I don't know. It's how is it trusted? Marketing was wasn't on that day. Marketing was feeling secure that day? Um, if I was to make an assumption, when we did the first command to basically bind those, those two nodes together, that established a trusting relationship between the two. And I would probably also make assumptions that there's some back end handshaking was going on to make sure that as you're writing data around it. No, I didn't see any out of band secrets being passed. Are you sniffing my internal network? <laughs> Or are you looking for like passwords or what are you? I, I'm what, wondering what the source of trust is, aside from you, you uh, pounding on the uh, virtual keyboard in both windows. Carry on. Okay. It's a good question. I'll, uh... All right. Only a pain in the ass customer will think to ask him. Now, let's see, now here in this, usually the sales was the uh, VP that wants to know what club they're going golfing at. <laughs> All right, so there's, I think I have to mount the XFS volume somewhere, and it wants a two-tiered directory structure. <coughs> Said you worked with Bluster before, right? Have you done this yet? Uh, it was very different. Right? Yeah, that was like three years ago. Huh? Oh yeah. Okay. It's somewhere I remember reading is that I have to mount this XFS file. So, so you got to format your break. Uh, yeah, I definitely had that amount of file system. And then you have to mount it locally, but this group really just do thing. Doesn't tell me where to mount it. consider it a trusted storage is because when you first start the cluster daemon on a single node, that's the only, only the local storage is considered trusted, right? So you have a single node cluster storage. And since you're logged into the console or wherever, presumably, you know, since you started the service, in theory, you can trust that host. And so you can only add things to that storage pool from that original and so when you do the peer probe, um, basically like the trust is that you set up cluster on the other machine and then you're adding it to the pool from your original node. I think that might be a little bit of a loaded word to use in this situation. Sounds, sounds like it makes that one node a spot. What's the answer? To what? Why is it trusted? Why is it trusted? Yeah. Oh, because you can only add other nodes to the storage pool from the original node you turn on until they're trusted. After 
you have added them, you can then add more nodes from the nodes that you've added. Okay. Yeah. You can't be rooted anywhere somewhere on the network and volunteer to join the cluster. You have to be invited. Okay. Something like that. How are we doing on top of the 15 point? Um, okay. If I don't have any immediate success with this, then we'll, we'll wrap up and we can just have a casual conversation and get on with beers. Make directory. Baked out thinking they should be different desktops. What's that? Yeah. Got two monitors. Why would you mirror them? They look dumb. Well, I only have one. <laughs> <I don't like laughs> From my point of view, you have two. <laughs> now, last last year when I was here doing a presentation with the um, Red Hat uh, Enterprise Virtualization Manager, the, the V Center experience of Red Hat Virtualization, yeah. um, we did have it split up to where. Uh, my colleague was working on this screen while I was working on this screen. And that was actually kind of cool. Um, but I also had a monitor that I brought with me up here, so I had dual, dual display going here as well. Okay, okay so, so, go ahead. So you're a sales guy. How much does an educational license for a rev cost? And a what? An educational license for a rev. Uh, you have to talk to the guys who work in the, the Fed, Fed group who do uh, state and local education. For, you mean for Rev, the, the manager? Yeah. Yeah, so the way it's <coughs> structured... Um, I mean to derail you. No, no, it's fine. But years. there is no cost to the Rev manager itself. The cost is in the number of sockets that you have in your virtualized environment. So from that perspective, if you've got 10 machines with four sockets of CPU, you basically license or entitle those systems to some level of virtualization, whether it's <coughs> one, four, or unlimited. But basically, once you have those entitled uh, through um, through uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, then you can deploy as many managers as you want. So if you want to do uh, an HA pair of managers, and yeah, yeah, put yeah. one into a data center, the other one in the lab or whatever. And most of no them it because we them. have an overt installation and it's kind of unreliable. Yeah. And so we're like, well, maybe we'll pay for support. Yeah. Um, so we're currently at 3.1 dot some version from there. Um, there was a lot of good stuff that showed up in 3.1. Uh, 3.2 I think is around the corner. Uh, we'll see. But um, for example, um, I think uh, the, the live storage migration is in tech preview, so it's there and it's functional. Um, there's a bunch of other features, especially for like VDI, if you're doing a virtual desktop infrastructure, that stuff is, is working really great in 3.1. And it's the same manager, so you, whether you're doing VDI or server virtualization, it's the same manager that you All right, so create new volume name. Blue test. Let's call blue one. Uh, I guess. Ten volume slash. I'm hoping I just do cluster slash two. Sorry, HS12 done in Colin? Uh, probably. I, I don't think I'm going to try and add that in here. It's kind of late in the game and it's yeah. just repeating the same commands again. Yeah. But it is done.
Uh, I have a different node that's ready to be compliant, which is the desktop. So if you're not confused enough as to where my desktop is, then I've got yet another one. That's virtual. Has anybody here played with uh, Spice? Uh, Spice is the VDI device driver, so it's basically like a Citrix ICA. That's what's going to give you the, the virtualized desktop. Performance of Spice on a local LAN is crazy good. You can uh, run high resolution video, all your audio works. Super good. And if you're running Windows, it feels and smells like it's running on your, your local system. So if you go like full screen, you get a really great VDI experience. You can play DVDs, it supports uh, uh, USB pass throughs, so you can connect up local devices and all that. Those are all things that were introduced with uh, 3.0 and 3.1 of the Rev Manager. What does it do for OpenGL apps in the guest? What does it do for OpenGL apps in the guest? So, I don't know. Uh, well, this thing's really thinking about it, so it's almost as if it accepted the commands. <coughs> All right, let's just see what happens next here. So, for example, we distribute volume, no, 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 that's just normal. So once we're done with that, just we return. All right. What? Yeah. So if you go up and you want to run that cluster volume info command. Does it mean literally volume? <laughs> Once that's done, I think you have to uh, start the volume. I think because I, I think it's it's running a little bit slower than expected because the DNS mask stuff in this NATed network is a little slow in responding. Because when I did like a host, it hangs for a while. Yeah. <coughs> so maybe there's some timeouts that we're dealing with here. Um, are there graphical tools for this, or, or is that too dangerous? Uh, so there is a graphical tool for GlosserFS that ships with the Red Hat storage appliance. I think the one that shipped originally has some problems. Uh, the ones that are available via update, or like currently in the engineering updates, are better. Um, the Rev Manager that we were talking about earlier is actually the console also for, for GlosserFS. And that seems to be pretty solid. There's, I have some mock-ups of what that looks like. Just don't have it here with me. How will the space work uh, remotely over an SSH connection? As compared to the VNC. Different kind of comparison. Um, Spice relies on a virtualized uh, video driver. So you have to install the QXL uh, drive. So you basically have to install QXL. So okay, I'll show you here. So if you go to the Virtual Machine Manager for my desktop, <coughs> and we look at the info, under Display, I've changed the type to Spice, and then under the Video Driver, you have to change that to QXL. And on the client itself, you also want to install the XOR QXL Video Driver, because um, what's going to happen is as your host is running, instead of rendering the image in a local frame buffer and then basically compressing it, shipping it across the wire and decompressing it, it's going to intercept the actual graphics language and compress that, ship it off to the client, and then allow the client to do all the rendering local. So VNC is more right. screen scraping kind of stuff. Huh? So it sounds like we're being configured right from the client there. Yes. So, I mean, if I was on the network, I could spice into my home lab, and, and again, it looks and feels like a local desktop for the most part, and that's, you know, running with my cable connection. I have Verizon files to deal with there. I've actually have reached the DSL connection. Yeah, the, um, the, the threshold for VDI latency seems to be about 100 milliseconds. So if you get above 100 milliseconds, that's when you know, the human eye can determine that it's not local, like you get stickiness and other, you know, as you're typing, your, your character will lag behind, that kind of thing. I already so, get that when you get zero. Yeah. So hopefully it'll be less of that. I would expect so. Um, one thing I'd 
uh, also to keep in mind is that the rev manager can tie into like Active Directory, so that if you wanted to manage your virtual desktops and have it, you know, be managed by your Active Directory uh, security infrastructure, that's all work there. If you don't have Active Directory in RHEL 6, we ship the uh, the ID um, IDM manager. So you can stand up the Red Hat uh, IPA server, essentially, which provides type Kerberos certificate management, DNS management under one framework, under a, it's a GUI, a, a web-based management you want. So you do all that, and then you don't need an active directory. What's that? What's that? Look at there, so I got two bricks, everything looks normal. Um, I just need to figure out how to start my volume and I think I can mount it from another system. Let's go find the word start. First, okay. then we'll then we'll play with the cluster FS and see what you think. So cluster volume start what I call the volume. Right, this ought to be cute. Can you do that at set up all the replications? Um, so I only did a distributed volume, not replicated. So that's where you need to, you know, you set it up and you configure it initially. Um, I think you can change the parameters on it. I know. That would have to be advanced cluster FS. Next, next topic. Okay. I some reason it wasn't as good. Sure, configuration you've got it. So I won't lose the volume, I'll lose whatever bricks are on there because again, the, the data all sits on regular file systems. So the data technically is all recoverable, but the integrity of the cluster file system is, yeah. Okay. I, I think that would be fairly accurate to say. All right, let's see here. Well, thank you, what's this guy doing? Two desktops. Okay, so now I'm going to show the Yeah, I don't know if this is supposed to work because of the No, I think if there's any slowness, it's probably because my DNS isn't set up correctly. Again, every every time the thing probably has to do a lookup, it's it's hanging up on stuff and timing out things. So you can create Etsy host files in about 30 seconds. I I did on two of the nodes, but it's still barfs on me. So Etsy host.
female key for both of them. What's that? Oh, thank you. That'll make things easier, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's never happened in the world of DNS. Well, all right. So now they've got that. Let's just make sure this guy has. See how fast it can go. That's much better. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if that's supposed to work. Wait, that's cool. So no, DNS fixes that problem. Okay, um, let's go to my desktop. This guy. Here's that new thing called the DNS portion. <laughs> Or it's trying to do a reverse lookup back to the desktop and it's complaining. <coughs> so, so, right. Zero. Yeah. Okay, so he's 20. Let's go ahead and here real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Would this all have been easier if you just brought a DHCP router? Uh, maybe. Uh, well, actually, no, because then I have to I have to do static. Um, then you have to push out the virtual client. Let's we'll see about. Okay, so that's that. Uh, let's go back to eleven. there and it's available for everybody to mount. Increase the verbosity of mount, like tell you what thing. What's that? Do you increase the verbosity of the mount command? Dash B. Doesn't it only serve version 3 by default? Yep.
Yeah, I think we just specified the NFS type, so just cache T NFS. Leave the V's in there, and then we'll find out for sure. What's that? Leave the V's in there. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. A dash T. Uh, NFS. I don't think there was a three. Was there a three? There was not a three. Right. Not a three. Yeah. We'll do four. And if S fails, then we'll go back and look up the mount command in the manual. And no, no, just do NFS. Yeah, no, get it, no, lose that. Yeah. Just do this? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, what we're looking for. Okay. Well, this fails, I'm going to go look it up here. Here we go. That's the command right there. Got it. Right, let's try this. Yeah, so you can still try version four. So we two subpoenas that you. All right. Options. Oh, oh no. Equals TCP. Uh, version equals three. You need to run what? Bonnie on it. Uh, do a benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Watch my virtual actually. machines fall over. Yeah. Uh, DF. So I mean, it all shows right there. I've got I've aggregated my two 10 gig volumes to this mount point. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, we'll leave that for the future. If we uh, come back for another session on cluster, we can expand it and look at some of the replication capabilities and do more specific demo of I'm going to write my data and we'll see how it gets split out across the environment. We could maybe set up two different volumes and have it replicate between the two and kind of explore. And if you're going to serve it via NFS, you're going to want to, you have to like load balance your mounts across your actual storage nodes, right? So you're going to yeah. set up. I think that makes sense. You can see that with DNS and like round robin for a set of addresses or something. I, I don't know what the recommended method, I can find out. And you can set that up in your new tool. Well, I mean, you just need each of your clients to be not in your, you know, mm -hmm. so I think you, you need to just do that with your own. So basically, every one of these nodes is uh, a potential NFS server. But if I go to one NFS server and the file itself exists on one of the other storage nodes, then that NFS server will fetch the data and tunnel it back through to my point. Um, if you want, we can try native cluster files. How much time have we got left? Ten minutes. Depends uh, how badly you want your view. Oops, I can't on that route. That's silly. That's silly. Okay, uh, let's see. You want dash L. Don't encourage me. Uh, okay, NFS. I think the native one is before this. Manually mounting volumes. I don't know if I have to install a package or not. Let's see here. Yeah, I don't have this system connected, so uh, it, there might be a package you need on the client level. We have the cluster tools, but let's find out. Okay. Uh, boy, that's a 
mount dash t cluster fs dash o So there's a client package I need to install. It's behind the access login, so. Um, I probably have it on the CD that's on there, but I'll track it down next time. It's not worth letting go for today. So, case in point, it worked. Okay. That's all I had. I'm, I'm I'm, I'm a little confused about exactly what you did here. I mean, you've got two virtual machines. They each have a 10, if I understand this correctly, they each have a 10 gigabyte. 10 gig disk. Disk, virtual disk. So let's, let's say instead of having a 10 gig disk, it had 20 10 gig disks. Right, okay. And so then instead of having two virtual machines, I've got two physical machines. Each one is considered a brick. No, the, the brick is the unit of storage. So those 10 disks, those are the bricks. Okay. So then the server contains bricks of storage. Right. I aggregate my servers together, which pulls the bricks together, and then they become a volume. Okay. But now when, if you put files on that 20 gigabyte partition that you got that's combined. Correct. Do the files end up on one of the XFS partitions that you have set up at the moment and not split between them? Uh, in this particular case, I would expect since it, a brick is similar to a block, until the block fills up and it spills over to the next one, that yeah, it would all end up on one server okay. until it spills over to the next brick. All right. And then that next brick would be defined as am I distributed like a Stripe file system? Or am I replicating? And maybe that's you know that's where those those other policies fall into play. Okay. So would it would it ever span two of those file systems? Yes. And how how would it do that? I don't know. Okay. And in terms the, of I, I have these very same questions because part of the um, part of where GlossRFS is fitting into the Red Hat stack now is it's also being supported as the um, image backend for the virtual machines. Mm -hmm. So if you're running Red Hat virtualization, you can use ClusterFS as the backend store for your VDK files, for example. And your, your host can be stored there, or your ISO images, for example, would also be there. So um, I don't know what the logic is of how things span across those bricks yet. Okay, but the implication is that if you lost an entire brick, you can still recover most of the files. I mean, if you lost a whole, one yeah. of those files. So the, 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 the intent is you got to keep your fingers out of the local file system because you want the cluster FS to do all the management of the data that goes in and out, right? right. Yeah. But worst case scenario, everything sits in a native POSIX file system so you can go in there and, and recover whatever's left. Um, and it is unstructured data, so all the files, everything should sit there. Um, and then the question of how does something that's so large that it exceeds the capacity of a single brick, how does that get broken up and distributed? That I don't really have to know. I'm going to find out shortly. All right, but in, in terms of you know RAID recovery of disks and so on, that's at the lower level. Below the that's brick. at the lower level, right? So if, if you follow the the white papers and the architectural diagrams, we really want hardware that has built-in RAID capabilities so you can survive disk failures. Um, and then you want to set the data replication policy so that you have multiple copies of your data in the cluster volume. Yeah. It's not as easy, easy as you would think, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot simpler than 
but you know the, the, the capabilities of, uh, for example, the Logic Boy Manager in RHEL 6.4 uh, also introduced a lot more RAID capabilities. Um, I don't think they want Gluster using the software RAID. They really want to rely on the hardware RAID for performance. Um, but you know, in a lab environment, that might be an appropriate use. And um, you know, if you're familiar with the, the, the Linux RAID story. There's essentially two different development trees. There's the RAID development that's going in an LVM, and then there's the older MD tools. Um, a team of people wrote a, uh, a bridging module called um, uh, DM RAID, I think it is. And DM RAID basically maps the personalities from MD into LVM. So now when you specify uh, Instead of saying you know, LVM type Mary and you say LVM type RAID 0 or RAID 1, you'll inherit the performance benefits of the MD tools and you'll get better performance and recovery and all the other aspects. There's, it's like one of those old development wars that goes on between two different teams. One guy refuses to accept patches, the other guy accepts too many of them. But the other tool is a lot older and has been around. I think it's been a good thing. Uh, now there's uh, support for RAID 10 um, with LVM. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Thanks.